know it's just like, man, it's like idyllic weather to kind of just get cozy and kind of like settle in and kind of snooze your way through a sermon this morning. But before we do that, hopefully you won't do that, but before we get into God's word, I'd just like you to stand with me. I'd love to just kind of go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Just so glad that you're here with us, either on campus or online, and just such a great opportunity to... My hope and desire is just that you would know God deeper and in a a fresh and a real way as we're gathered together this morning. And Lord, I just ask that you would do that. Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us through your holy word. Thank you so much this morning that we're not gathered to hear just some, I don't know, just some good thoughts on life or some fishing stories and make an application. But Lord, we're here to dig into your word. I thank you for the, the team that just led us in worship. Lord, I thank you for so many of them that, that volunteer their time and bless us with that skill set and that, that passion to lead us in song so that we can actually express thanksgiving and praise to you. I pray that wouldn't be lost on us, Lord. But Lord, that truly our hearts would be open. God, that you'd speak. Lord, I I need to ask you something. I I need to ask for your help. Lord, I'm I'm in this position this morning where I'm teaching your word. And Lord, I know me. (laughs) I I know you know me. And and I need your help to just be able to clearly communicate and serve your people. So that as we study your word, we see you. We hear you. We're we're encouraged. and, And Lord, that we're, and even some ways, Lord, corrected maybe. And given a fresh perspective of who you are that's accurate and true according to the scriptures. God, help me to serve your people in such a way that that would happen this morning. Lord, bless this time. For those gathered in this room, those maybe joining us online, for our our junior high and high school students, Lord, our kids this morning. as, As we're all on campus this morning, God, I just ask that you'd speak. I'm so thankful, Lord, that I can pray this in a name that actually matters. There's so many names out there that have so much under them, but Lord, Jesus, you said all authority and power has been given unto you. Jesus, you're the risen Savior, that one we sung about. And it's in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one who claimed to be and proved to be the one and only Son of God, we pray. Amen. 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 With that, why don't you grab a seat and um, grab your Bibles. If you, if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to open up to Romans 15. As Pastor Joe mentioned, we're going to be kind of rounding out the 15th chapter of the book of Romans. And our plan and our hope is to kind of have about two more messages through Romans chapter 16, the week next week and the week thereafter. But this morning, we're really going to kind of finish out this passage of Romans 15 with a second part to a message that I'm calling this, making your days doxological. Now you may say, what the heck is that church word, right? Like, well, if you're with us last week, you'll remember that Romans 15, it's this powerful portion of scripture in which Paul declares and expresses through language the goodness, the greatness, the grandeur of God. And that's all a doxology is. A doxology is just an expression of praise. And in Romans 15, at least in the first 13 verses, we saw two doxologies, expressions of praise. Here's the first one. That God is the God of patience and encouragement. And then in verse 13, we saw this second one, that God is the God of hope. God. He's got the corner on, the the perspective, the authority on true patience, true hope, true encouragement. And what we learned a little last week is kind of how to position our lives. Maybe you remember this cheesy little phrase that I shared with you that actually one of my mentors once said. He said, Neil, always position your life in such a way that you're under, well, you're under the spout where the blessing comes out. You may say, what the heck does that mean? I don't have time to talk about that. You're going to have to listen to next, last week if you want, but... To live your life in such a way that you can actually experience who this God is. Listen, God's a God of hope. God's a God of encouragement. God's a God of patience. See, here's the deal. As a believer, 
If you're evidencing in your life maybe discouragement, frustration, snarkiness. You know what that word is? Like just people you don't really want to hang with. Like rudeness. I don't know that God's that God of those things. But he is the God of hope, patience, and encouragement. And as you walk with God and live, let me have your attention, let me see your eyes if I can. As you live under his lordship, you will become like him. See, so much of being a Christian is is stop trying to be like Jesus and just start liking Jesus. And the more you like Jesus, the more you become like Jesus. See, the more you come under his lordship, you start to experience, God, you're you're the God of hope. You're the God of encouragement. You're the God of patience. And last week, we, we looked at three life lessons, three really practical ways that you and I like that phrase, like get under that spout where that blessing comes out. And I'm not going to review those from last week. I need about an hour and a half of your time to unpack the rest of Romans 15 this morning. Just teasing. Um, but this morning we are going to look at four lessons. But here's the deal. You do have to engage with these. These aren't academic. These are those that are to be appropriated in your life, acted upon. It's kind of like this. Five children, two sons in, in my life currently. I say currently because my wife would love to have seven kids, but that's another discussion altogether. I feel like five's a full house. How many would agree? No, I won't do that right now, but like five's full, right? Like, man, I obeyed the Bible, be fruitful and multiply. We did that. We have five. But anyway, um, the different conversation, I digress. But my two sons, my two sons, Uliam, like William with a U, Uliam Lee Neal, He turned five last Sunday. And Leonidas Ulysses Stephen, he turns two this Wednesday. I can explain those names and why they're, you know, what, what, that's weird. But anyway, I can explain that later. Not today. But anyway, we we celebrated these boys last Sunday with a joint birthday. Their birthdays are both in August. And this is what we kind of gave them to kind of celebrate. And it was not a good purchase, I think. Like, because these things right here, like these are going to be like hell raisers for them, right? But they love them. They're like these little electric bikes and Anyway, here's the deal. Like, in order to enjoy these things, though, the boys, they got to grab a hold of them. They got to ride them. Let me show you what I mean when they first got them. This is kind of what they did. That's little Liam. His name's Uliam. He's loving it. What you think, Liam? You love it? You hear some cries in the background? Here's my other boy. He's got the safety vest on, away from the pool. Now, I don't know if you caught that, but when it was his turn, he kind of did this. Whoa, right? Like Liam, his older brother, he grabbed it by the handles, got his foot on the pegs, and he's cruising around, even asking questions. Does this thing go in reverse? Like, that's what he wants to know. But his brother, and come on, his brother, he's only two. He's figuring it out. He's got to keep that vest on to stay feel like he's good. Like... He's backing up a little bit. Why do I share this with you? Because we're about to look at four life lessons. There's seven in the book of Romans 15. Sick of me. But I do want to live for him. I want to make my days doxological. It's a choice I have to make daily. But there's going to be four lessons. And here's what's going to happen this morning. I know it's going to happen. Because we're human beings. Some of us are going to listen to this and go, man, I see those handles. I'm grabbing a hold. I want to live for the Lord. And some of us are going to pull a Leo. We're going to back up a little bit. We're going to hear these lessons this morning. And like many who saw Jesus teach in person. Said these are hard sayings. Like who can do this? That's what it means to be a disciple right? That's what we're called to. It's not about that get out of hell card. That's not in the Bible. It's it's about a pathway of discipleship and where you are radically changed by God and the rest of your days are directed by him. Not your passions, not your pursuits, not your pleasures, but by God. By God. And here's the first lesson. I'm going to go ahead and put it up on the screen. I'll even do it in like a graphic. So like, oh, I see that. Here it is. It starts in verse 14, goes all the way through verse 21. But this is what Paul says. It's about a lifestyle of service, not 
selfishness. Look at verse 14. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He writes this. I'm fully convinced, my dear brothers and sisters, that you're full of goodness. You know the things so well. What things? Those things from what we learned last Sunday. And you can teach others all about them. Even so, I have been bold enough to write about some of these points knowing that all you need is a reminder. Don't you love the tone of the Apostle Paul? He's not an ivory tower kind of guy. Like he doesn't sit from his perch writing to those Christians in Rome going, you stinking sinners. No, he goes, hey family, (laughs) I'm encouraged by you guys. I I know that you're walking with the Lord. I I know that you need to be Reminded of these things. And listen, I think we all, I don't, I don't, it doesn't directly matter how old you are in the Lord. But every single one of us need to constantly and consistently be reminded. Reminded. You see, my my bride and I, we've been married 13 years. We have five children, we've owned four homes together, and we've served in two churches. We don't have a perfect marriage. You may go, what? Yeah, I'm just like you. But I do think we have a great marriage. And I know that in the season that we're currently in and in every season as a couple, we still need to date one another. And Friday night, sorry, my mom is calling me at the moment. I got to tell her not to do that. She's not here today. Anyway, all that to say, mom, anyway. We have a great marriage is what I was trying to say. And Friday night, I had this opportunity to take my, my wife on a little date. And I'd never been to this place before. But there's this restaurant downtown Pensacola known as Jackson's. Anyone ever maybe kind of heard of Jackson's? Some of the ladies are like, yes, I love Jackson's. Like, love that place. Well, I'd never been. You know why I'd never been? I don't know that like my like socioeconomic status, like what I kind of bring to the table, if I can actually bring it to that table, right? Like I don't know like that I could actually afford what they're going to lay down. And it's like it's hard to get a reservation. We're living in a COVID world. We're like, man, if you don't get that reservation like eight months ago, pre-COVID, you don't get in there. Like, How did you do that? But anyway, like by God's grace, we like we got in on Friday night and it was this crazy thing because I was like Friday morning, let's go on a date. And my wife said, let's check this place. And there it is. Like, wow, God's telling us to go to Jackson. It's like, oh, cool. Um, anyway, but we went. And I'll give you a little secret. This isn't a plug for Jackson's. But if you get there between 5.30 and, and 6, they got this little thing called Jackson's Prelude. Not going to tell you what that is. But what it is, sort of, you can afford it. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> and it's still good. It's still good. But you're there. Anyway, I say all that to say. But it was a good time for us. Because as a husband, I need to remind my wife, sweetie, I love you. I think you're gorgeous. I I love our life together. We need to constantly have tangible things in our life where there's platforms of remembrance. And a date can do that. We all need reminding. And Paul says here in these couple of verses, listen, listen. I'm bold enough to remind you about the good news of Jesus. See, growing up as a kid, I kind of grew up sitting right over there. I kind of thought, honestly, like the gospel was for those people that hadn't yet heard it. And then once you've heard it, like, it's an old hat, man. We know that. Like, we don't need to sing that song. Like, we, no. But here's the reality. The gospel, the good news, is something that we need to not only embrace every day, but we need to hear it afresh every single day. Well, who should tell us? I love this guy named Paul David Tripp. He writes this. No one is more influential in your life than you are. Because no one talks to you more than you do. Right? Like we're always kind of talking to ourselves. And this is what he says. Tell yourself, remind yourself, preach to yourself the greatest truth daily. And he goes on to unpack this. He says... In our sin, we constantly find our responses to life in our fallen world to be disconnected from the theology that we confess. Anger, fear, panic, discouragement. They stalk our hearts and whisper a false gospel that will lure our lives away from what we say we believe. The battleground, he says, 
is meditation. You say, what do you mean? Like Eastern? No. What's capturing your idle thoughts? What fear or frustration is filling your spare moments? Will you listen to yourself or will you start talking? No, preaching. Not letting your concerns shape you, but forming your concerns by the gospel. I know every single day I need to be reminded I've been forgiven. I was lost, but I've been found. I was blind, but now I see. I've been forgiven because of Jesus. Some of you came into this place in shame. And you need to be reminded every single day, and ain't nobody else going to tell you, so you need to tell yourself this in Jesus' name. I'm forgiven because of what Jesus has done. And, and we also need to recognize that you're not bound. Read the book of Romans. Not only are you forgiven, but you're made free in Christ. Sin no longer has a hold over you. And you're not alone. Because of Jesus, because of the good news of the cross and the empty tomb, there's forgiveness, there's freedom. You're part of a brand new family. That the blood that binds us together is thicker than the blood that goes through your veins. And lastly, church, as the good news, you've got a future. You've got a future. I think it was Rob just moments ago said, no matter what happens, we still have the gospel every single day. But listen, nobody has more influence over you than you. Because you constantly tell yourself stuff. Tell yourself the truth. The good news of the gospel. And I'm forgiven, I'm free, I'm a part of a family, and there's a future. There's a future for me because of who Jesus is. And in these next few verses, he begins to unpack this point about service and not selfishness. Look again at verse 15 where he says, For by God's grace, I'm a special messenger from Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. I bring you the good news so that I might present you as an acceptable offering to God made holy by the Holy Spirit. See, this is a big topic, a lifestyle of service. So you know what Paul does in verses 15 through 21? Paul's crazy, man. He lists out like six bullet points of how you can do this. It's the first thing he says in verses 15 through 16 is this. We are all called to point people to Jesus. That's what he says. He says, you want to live a lifestyle of service, not selfishness? Who are you pointing to? Who are you pointing to? And you all give, I give, tells. You ever been in like a boxing match or something where they're like, you can tell when he's about ready to throw that right because he, he twists his hip or something or changes his footing? Like there's tells that we all give about our own spiritual health. So you really? Yeah, if I see like that lack of hope, that discouragement that's just kind of dogging your days. You go, oh man, there's some sort of disconnect there. They're missing a connection with the Lord. Or they're going through a season. I need to point them to Jesus. See, a lifestyle of selfishness, it's always pointing to this. Like, use this as an illustration. How many of you guys came into this room this morning that are in, seated in here? This is a trick question. Everybody did. Everybody in here is you're in here. That's just like a law of identity. You can't be a non-A and A at the same time. You are in the room. Somehow you got in here. And you know, like there's some people around you right now. It's another thing. Like, yes, there are. Like there's people around you. And I think when we come into church, we've got this ability to point people to somebody or something. And as the church gathered, it's not necessarily about what we're about to get, what we're about to receive what we can kind of extract from this experience together. But it's honestly more about pointing one another to Jesus. And as you walked in this morning, you had an opportunity through your attitude, through your actions, through your choice to say hi or not say hi to help foster someone in pointing them closer to Jesus. Did you choose to do that? You say, no, I'm an introvert. I'm excused. No, the Bible doesn't say that. Like, it doesn't say like introverts, this doesn't apply to you. No, like point people to Jesus that was Paul's whole deal verse 16 he says listen I'm a special messenger and let me just tell you something if I can have your attention let me see your eyes so are you you are a special messenger herald or proclaimer of the gospel step into that calling point people to Jesus and in verse 17 he unpacks it a little bit by saying you know what have a little enthusiasm about it. Look at verse 17. He says, So I have reason to be enthusiastic 
about all Christ Jesus has done through me in my service to God. Enthusiasm. The word comes from this meaning of entheos, if you break down the etymology of the word. It simply just means to be filled with God. You know, I have this pastor in my life who I had the opportunity to serve under. Uh, This is the guy right here. His name's Ricky Ryan. Love Pastor Ricky. Such a great heart for people and for the Lord. But here's the deal. When you're in Ricky's presence, there ain't no way in the world you can't smile. See, what do you mean? Because he grabs you by the shoulders. And he goes, hey, are you stoked? And I'm like, I don't know what that word means. What does it mean, am I stoked? And he's like, listen, God loves you. He gives you these big bear hugs. I never, I'll never forget serving under him and working alongside him. He'd always see me go, Neil, how's it? I was like, how's it? What is this? He's like, I guess it's like a Hawaiian thing. He lived there for a while. It's how you say hello. I was like, oh, it's going well. Like, <laughs> I guess it's good. But this guy, Ricky, what I love about him, yeah, his personality lends a little bit to extra avertedness, but man, it's a choice to choose joy. It's a choice to step into something, especially because of us as a believer. We could say, man, I'm forgiven, free. I have a family and there's future. I can choose to allow the joy of the Lord to be my strength. And that's what's going to light my fire. And then in verse 18, he gives this other opportunity for us where he talks about this reality that a lifestyle of service, man, pride has no place. Look at verse 18. He says, yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by the way I worked among them. He said, God is the one who does the work. I'm just the vessel. Root beer floats, man. They're wonderful. But when it's time to get a root beer float, you're not enamored with the plastic container it comes in. Like, look at this container I got. No, like when I show up to my kids, I got the root beer float. They could care less about that container. Get that goodness out of there and put it on the ice cream, right? Like the goodness of God is that which flows through our lives. But we're the containers. But yeah, there's some dynamics. The container needs to be clean, needs to be available, needs to be usable. All those things. Get that. But what Paul says here is, listen, pride has no place in the life of a believer who wants to live doxologically. Who wants to live grabbing those handles. That's why he says there in verse 19, they, speaking of the Gentiles, were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's spirit. And look at what he says here. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. What does this mean? Paul is showing something here that I think is so helpful as a believer. That living a life of service has this dynamic where you're balancing both your work ethic and the work of God. Your work ethic and the work of God. Paul says, look, those who God radically changed, God showed up. You ever read the book of Acts? Like some powerful Like even like otherworldly, mystical, miraculous things happened. God showed up and it was about him. But you know what also happened? Paul worked hard. Warren Wearsby, a well-known Bible commentator and scholar, once said, if you take into consideration all of Paul's journeys, he traveled over 14,000 miles to preach the gospel. Anyone ever walked? sailed only powered by wind or ridden a horse 14,000 miles Paul did why because he wanted to be one of these guys like just yoked right like just a guy like man I walked 14,000 miles how many's on your little run keeper app no <laughs> like where he was at was what motivates me is the good news and it's worth dying for I'm gonna lay everything down so that others can know Jesus I'll go 14,000 miles. I've driven across our country a couple times. And that was a bit. Ba- Anyone ever drove through Texas? Like that's not Texas on the 10. Takes forever. But Paul says, man, I walked that. I-, I donkeyed that thing, right? Like I rode that. Why? So that other people could know Jesus. Let me just ask you a question in this dynamic. 
is your life really evidencing a life about service to Jesus? Oh, you're saying, yeah, dude, I do all this stuff, but it's self-centered. It's self-motivated. The end is self. See, in living a life of service, not selfishness, there's balance and trusting in seeing God work the miraculous. But also this, let me just be honest with you. Not being a kook, not being lazy, but working hard. And, and I think if I can say this in all humility, we should be leaning into and looking more and being concerned more about our work ethic for the Lord and I'm going to say this, and this will be divisive for some, and I know, that, I know that. But then always chasing after his presence. So what do you mean by that? God is present. It's not like he's doing something over there that he's not willing to do here. It's not like you've got to go find his presence and where the Spirit's moving now. No, that's burdensome. That's legalism. That's kooky. But there's so many today that would say, I'm chasing after... God is omnipresent. That's who he is. He doesn't put the clothes sign up. He's available. And God can do the miraculous. But oftentimes, I think some of us are just a little lazy. L like when it comes to serving the Lord. And don't please hear a legalistic tone. Man, we don't do this to earn salvation. It's the gospel. We're free. We're forgiven. But Paul here, man, 14K? Who, who does? Like the bumpers, 14K. I mean, that's crazy. And in verse 20, he kind of keeps unpacking his MO. He says, my ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard. Listen to what he says. This is the New Living Translation where he says, rather than where a church has already been started by someone else. He says, I want to take the gospel to those who haven't heard it. He says, and I, I'm ambitious in this. Like, I'm motivated. I don't want to just duplicate what's down the road. You see, for Paul, the takeaway for number five here about how to live a life of service, it's about respect. It's about honor. It's about collaboration, not competition. Paul says there's so many people who need Jesus. And if someone's already reaching them, I don't need to duplicate that. I want to respect. I want to honor. I want to collaborate, not compete. Again, let me say something at this moment if I can. Does this mean it's wrong to plant a church in a town that already has one? Maybe. Maybe. Say, what do you mean by that? Church is a good thing. Yeah, but take this in context. There's nothing wrong with partnering, assisting, collaborating with an established ministry. I mean, in, in some way, that's kind of what my dad and I are doing here as we walk through this transition. I didn't plant this church. For me to come in here and have the opportunity to serve you guys through teaching the word and be in this transitional season where he's going to remain on staff and I'm going to take the role of the, the lead pastor. Like, I don't deserve that. That's not owed to me. But by God's grace, I'm able to kind of step into the foundation that he's laid. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not a, a bad thing. And there's nothing wrong with seeing a new church planted in a community that already has churches but that's not a carbon copy of something that's within the same proximity. Nothing wrong with that. But when a new work or a new fellowship starts in an area where there's already a, a work that kind of shares the same theology, the same practice, the same style, the same ethos, if you want to use that word, and reach or has to build what they're doing from a church down the road, I'll just be honest, man, that smells a little funny to me. And you may say, well, who are you to say that? Nobody. <laughs> Let me say that. I'm a nobody from nowhere, man. But I will say this. In the last 10 years of my life, in varying degrees, 
I've had dynamics with church planting. Let me just use this local area. Five of them. Panama City, 30A in Santa Rosa Beach, Destin, Fort Walton Beach, and Navarre. In the last 10 years of my life, I've tried to do everything I know to do to help assist, give platform, set up for health, gospel preaching, disciple making, Bible teaching churches in areas, believe this or not, in the south and along the Gulf Coast, believe this or not, that don't have that expression of a church. You say, what are you saying? That's a pretty outlandish claim. To say that all along our coastline, that, you, that I'm just saying this, that there's no Calvary chapels, let's put it that way. Like just our own family, right, of who we are. And in varying degrees in Panama City, 30A Santa Rosa Beach, Destin, Fort Walton Beach, and Navarre, in the last 10 years, I've had a varying degree of dynamics with church planting. And what I mean by that is these are positive church planting experiences. Churches that are, by God's grace, planted and growing and, and doing well and the leadership is solid and they're under the authority of scripture and they've got good accountability and they're preaching the gospel and they're teaching through the Bible, not just teaching whatever they're teaching, like they're teaching the Bible. People are getting saved. Orphan care is happening. Ministry to the needs of those who really need stuff. Poor people. Like stuff that a church is supposed to be about. These guys and these churches are doing it. And they're doing it well. One of those churches, I had the opportunity to plant. Other churches, like, okay, so this pastor, this planter has a heart. Let's take 30 people from our church. Go. Go. Let's see it happen. Okay, another one this way. 70 people. Go. Let's see what happens. A new pastor moved in the area from SoCal, had a heart for Panama City. How can we help him? How can we train? How can we resource? You guys are familiar with the one in Navarre. How can we help pay for that? My heart is to see authentic Bible teaching, gospel preaching churches all along our coastline. But I will say in the last 10 years, I've also seen a dynamic where there's like those that kind of show up on the scene and they're like, we could kind of do what you're doing better. And I go, well, yeah, have you met me? Like, I'm an idiot. Like, of course you could. Like, and we'll be able to better minister to the people that you're pastoring. I, I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that at all. But yikes, like that's what you're doing? <laughs> you're kind of, that's your MO? Bummer, man. One of my mentors once said about church planting or starting a ministry or birthing something new, he said, Neil, birthing a ministry has a lot of like parallels to seeing the birth of a baby. He said, man, when it's done right, people shout it from the mountaintops. People are excited like, like there's no one that's like, oh, that's kind of like not a, but when maybe there's a dynamic and it's like, and the baby is never seen as the, the problem, but maybe there's this dynamic that, oh man, it kind of happened in this way and that, and there's a little bit of secrecy, there's a little bit of whispering, there's a little bit of like haziness there, a little bit of distraction maybe, whatever it is. Um, that's okay. My mom called. How much worse can it get than that? I mean... People can do this job better. But anyway, um, he said basically this, man, when it's, when it's done right, like, pff, people are stoked. Everyone you talk to is stoked. When it's not, it's kind of like, what, what's happening there? Why is that so hazy? And that resonated with me. I've seen that in the last decade of my life. And again, I'm just nobody from nowhere, man. I don't, I don't have a corner on things. But I do know that fruit speaks for itself. And what's best for the gospel and the work of a community is that all churches speak well of one another. Another mentor of mine once said when I saw a church planning dynamic, maybe not in my small, humble opinion, maybe be the best fit for everybody, this mentor said, Neil, the best thing you can do for the gospel is speak well of one another. You've got to remember there's people that don't love Jesus. It's not all about church world. Like, Respect one another, honor one another, collaborate together. And that's what Paul did. And the last point of this big point, you got, my goodness, we're on point one, he has three more. Don't worry, they come together like butter. They'll, they'll come together quick. But in, in verse 21, 
Paul takes his cue from scripture, not culture. He says, I've been following the plan spoken of in the scriptures where it says those who have never been told of him will see him. And those who've never heard of him will understand. I love this about Paul and living a life of service. He didn't try to feel out the temperature of culture to figure out how he should follow the Lord. He said, I'm taking my cues from scripture. And let me just say this, like this first point, getting a hold or a handle on living your life for the glory of God and thereby experiencing God. It's powerful, man. There's a lot of content here. I get that. I know it's like drinking from eight fire hydrants. I understand. But why am I belaboring this point? Because I think selfishness is something we deal with nanosecond by nanosecond. (laughs) I think it's something we always are going to deal with as believers. That's why Jesus said, take up your cross daily and die to yourself. Because the flesh is always trying to get back into that seat of driving. You know where I see this is I see it in this little precious guy. Remember, remember Leo, the guy that like um, didn't want to ride the, uh, the motorcycle? Well, this was him yesterday. He's almost two. And you would think by seeing that, I heard someone go, oh, I understand. Like you, you would think that, man, his mom's probably pulling his toenails off. That's what's happening. No, I'll tell you what's happening. He almost, is almost two. So he's reached the age in our world where he's able to have gummy vitamins. Now, I know there's differences of opinions on that. Email my wife about it. I don't have anything to do with it. But like, he's just now able to get a couple of little, little vitamins and like, he knows what a cookie is. You know, that's a bummer. But it was like 6.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. And you know why he's so mad? Leonidas, Ulysses, you know what that name means? It means the wrathful hater. I didn't name him well. But like, this is what he's doing. He's mad because we wouldn't give him 18 gummies. He's mad because we didn't just let him like take the Oreo box. He's frustrated and he's going to tell you about it. Why? Because that little guy is stinking selfish, man. I'll be honest with you. I never met a more self-centered human (laughs) than probably me. He probably takes after me. But he's a two-year-old. You don't don't reason with two-year-olds. If you do, God bless you. But, like, (laughs) that's just the dynamic there. But it it lends itself to this reality. At our core, we're going to fight for self to some degree. It's just in us. Self-preservation is one of the strongest MOs of a human And Jesus says, listen, it's about a lifestyle of service, not selfishness. Look at these six things. Like, these are like ways that you and I can just kind of take an opportunity this morning to go, well, where am I at? You know, cars need to be constantly realigned. In your spiritual vehicle, it's constantly realigning. Like, Lord, 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 I need to serve you. I don't want to be selfish. This is the handle of positioning your life in such a way where you experience the Lord for who he is. Now, in verses 22 through 24, he's going to give this second handle. And we'll, we'll breeze through these, don't worry. He says, in fact, my visit to you has been delayed so long because I've been preaching in these places. But now I have finished my work in these regions. And after all these long years of waiting, I'm eager to visit you. I'm planning to go to Spain. And when I do, I'm going to stop off in Rome. And after I've enjoyed your fellowship for a little while, maybe you can help provide for my journey. See, Paul's a dreamer, right? He's a visionary. He's making plans. Not to do this, like, right? Like most of us when we say dream, I'm dreaming to build that house, right? Can't wait to get, that's most of us if we're honest. But here's what Paul is. He's a dreamer, he's a visionary, he's a planner and centered upon the gospel. So here's our second takeaway. Dare to dream, make a plan. You know, Paul didn't have a crystal ball. He's not that guy from the Wizard of Oz, right? Like, he knew God's heart for people. He knew the word. He listened to the leadership of his life, and then he got to work. He set goals. He dreamed. He made plans. He dreamed. I'll never forget visiting a friend. I spent some time in my life in the central coast of California, and um, just a, a lot of dear friends in that area. And I'll never forget visiting one of my, one of my buddies. And um, man, it didn't make sense. Like everything in life was going so well on the surface. Like marriage, ministry, like central coast of California, a great place to live. And, but he wasn't good. He was down. And so I spent some time with him. And 
I was only there for a couple hours. I had to be somewhere else. And I just said, man, what's going on? And uh, he said, I, I just, I don't want to do what I'm doing. And I barely remember this conversation. And I said, well, well, life's too short to do that. Like, in Jesus' name, like, go get happy in Jesus. What I meant by that was, like, find your passion under the Lord and go serve him in it. Like, go for it. Life's too short to just be miserable. Like, go do it. And I forgot about that conversation, hopped on a plane and came home. And then two weeks later, he called me up and said, Neil, I've been thinking about that conversation. So what are you talking about? What conversation? He said, well, that, that conversation, don't you remember? Like, no, I have no idea. And again, I'm not that, I don't know. Um, he said, that, you said, man, like, go follow the Lord, basically, with all your heart, like, lean into it. Life's too short. I said, oh, yeah, I kind of remember that. He said, you know what, I, I've been praying about that. My wife and I have prayed, and we're moving to Lithuania. I said, what? <laughs> what is Lithuania? Uh, he said, well, it's this place. I was like, whoa. I said, you know who you're talking to. Like, we need to go talk to some smarter people. Like, I'm all about, like, you, like, following the Lord, but don't you dare tell your mom I told you to move to Lithuania. You know what I mean? Like, and then I, I could unpack that story more, and, but I won't just to leave you hanging. Cause, but anyway, he didn't end up moving to Lithuania. He ended up doing something else. But anyway, here's what I have to say. One of my mentors once told me this thing that just has so stuck with me and helped me through so many different dynamics. He said this, Neil, when you stop dreaming, you start dying. Like there has to be this space and place and margin in your heart where you're like, God, what do you want to do and how can I do it? God, where, I, where I'm dreaming. See, most people die at the age of 18 and wait till their 70s or their 80s to be buried. They're just going through life. No dreams, no passions, no plans. But in Jesus' name, I want to encourage you to dream a little bit. You say, what do you mean? Look at Paul. He says, hey, I'm going to come to see you guys. I'm going to Spain. I'm doing this, that, and the other. If you know church history, I don't know if he got to Spain. He did get to Rome, but it was as a prisoner. Not as his plans thought they would work out. But under the word, in concert with the spiritual leadership of your life, dream a little. Set some goals. It's not just pie in the sky dreaming. Some person once said a goal without a plan is a dream and a dream without a plan is only a wish. I'm not calling you to wish. But to dream. And that plan is there. I've, I've got a dear friend in my life who honestly this person is kind of afraid of making plans. So what do you mean? I've had like so many conversations with this dear friend of mine. Um, we've talked about oh, this and that and one of, either it's spiritual endeavors or just health or whatever. I was like, well, let's just put a couple action steps to that. And this person always goes, I don't want to make a plan. Why? Well, because I'm afraid if I set the plan, then I'm like captive to the plan. And when I don't do it, I'm going to be a failure and I don't want to walk in failure and shame. So that's why I don't want to make a plan. And I have always looked at it like this, like, well... A plan is written in sand. Like the plan can change. It's not about being married to the plan. A plan is just a, a tool. And a plan is a great tool, but a terrible master. You want to know why? Because life is lived like this right here. Like you make your plans and then God has plans. And so if you're like, well, this was the plan. And then God goes, well, who the heck are you? Like, right? Like this is where things are going, but we're still called. Look at Paul to like take these steps and be okay with, you know, your plans. But they're your plans. You're not God. Like, but take steps. Life's not lived from point one to point two. And God's big enough to handle your dreams. But Paul dared to dream, man. He made a plan. And those dreams weren't self-centered. They were about others. And in verse 25, he says, before I come, I must go to Jerusalem to take a gift to the believers. in Jerusalem and they were glad to do this because they feel they owe a real debt to him. See the Gentiles received spiritual blessings. They heard the gospel the good news from the believers in Jerusalem and they feel that the least that they can do in return is to help them financially and as soon as I've delivered this money and completed this good deed of theirs I'm coming to see you on my way to Spain and I'm sure when I come, Christ will richly bless our time together. Can't you just hear his heart? It's like brimming with promise and praise. And 
you got to get a little bit of context of this. Like Paul is writing this letter from the city of Corinth. If you've ever looked at a map, Corinth to Rome is a shorter distance than Corinth to Jerusalem. So why is Paul and all of his dreams and all of his plans of getting there, Paul, why are you going to Jerusalem? Here's why. Paul cared about people. Paul didn't leave a trail of dead bodies behind a project, right? Like people to him weren't workhorses. He didn't use people. He sought to be a blessing to people. And as he was resourced, he he sought to resource others. You want to live a life that glorifies God? This is where most of us are going to back away from this handle. I know it is. You want your days to be doxological in which you experience the God of hope and encouragement and peace? Then here's the third point. Live to give. Be resourced to resource. You've heard it put it this way. You're blessed to be a blessing. Maybe the reason you're miserable is because you, God's blessed you and you hoarded it. Like you saw life as a reservoir. That's what I do. Stuff comes in, it stays in. But no, man, you're meant to be a conduit. Like where God brings stuff in and you let it go. God brings stuff in and you give it away. I'll never forget in my experiences of church planting, I, I got an opportunity to meet this physician. And this physician, man, sweetest guy in the world, so stinking kind and, and wealthy and had more money than he needed. Don't we all want those problems? Like, but here's what, he, here's what he realized. He said, you know, like, he says, I give my whatever, you know, I, I give to the church and do these things, but I've got all this resource. And like spending it on myself or investing or even like setting up my family for success, like, It's only going so far. Why do I have all this money? I could have said, I know why, because you met me and I need money. No, like, no, I didn't say that by God's grace. Thank you, Lord, that I didn't say that. But like, (laughs) but I said this basic thing. I said, well, perhaps you're, you're resourced to help resource others. Maybe God wants to use that. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, why don't you do this little exercise, right? Like, make a plan. I'm a planner, so like, Make a plan. Um, But I said, well, why don't you just do the math? Like, if you were to just take it week by week, like, how much in your budget would you say, like, man, I could afford to, like, give that to people to help them or just support them or resource them and still be good. I can still be really good, to be honest with you. But, like, still be good. So he came back, and it was in kind of like the thousands. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Um, (laughs) So, like, what are you going to do with that? I said, I don't know. I said, well, why don't you try this? Just pray. Like, don't do anything. Just pray. Say, God, order my steps. Order my days. I'm ready. I've got the plan now. Like, bring people. Show me things. And I've known this guy for a few years, and it was a little bit of a slow start, but, like, as the weeks went, months, years, God brought so many opportunities. And he, but he wasn't, awake, he wasn't awake to them earlier. Like, for that conversation, he said, man, God's been bringing opportunities in my life forever. And I didn't know what I was supposed to do with this money. And now I know that I'm resource to resource. And he said, I've got to be honest with you. This is the most fun I've ever had. Like to be able to like say, hey, I can, I can help you with that mortgage for this month. Like for some people that's like, thank you. Like I was not even going to be able to put bread on the table because I'm trying to pay that mortgage. And he's like, I, I can help with that for a few months. A few months? Like that sets me up where I can actually have a life. Like. But see, when you, when you use resource just for yourself, it's like kicking rocks into the Grand Canyon and hoping to fulfill that void that's your heart. You're not called to do that. You're called to live to give. You're called to be resource to resource. And Paul shares this fourth and final handle in Romans 15, starting in verse 30 through 33, and he says this. Dear brothers and sisters, listen to the tone of this. I urge you, when was the last time you used that word? I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to do what? To join me in my struggle, your struggle, by praying to God for me. Do this because of your love for me, given to you by the Holy Spirit. Verse 31, I pray that I would be rescued. Paul, you're struggling? You need to be rescued? 
from those in Judea who refuse to obey God, pray also that the believers that are there, that they'd be willing to accept the donation that I'm taking to Jerusalem. Then by the will of God, I'm going to be able to come to you with a, with a joyful heart. You mean you're not joyful right now? And we'll be in an encouragement. You need some encouragement? And now may God who gives us his peace be with you all. Amen. This is the last point, but here's what happens. Paul invites others into his life. He shares his struggle and his needs and their needs for, and the need for prayer. And he says, I, I need to be rescued. I need joy in my heart. I need encouragement. Here's the fourth and final point. Transparency, authenticity, and I'd even add vulnerability are the greatest currency. In relationships, they are. See, here's the deal. Paul didn't present himself as this guy, right? Like you hear the chimes in the background. Like he's showing up as the church planner. Ain't nobody going to touch him. He's solid. 14K bumper sticker. You know what I mean? Like he's the guy. No, you know what Paul did? He said, it's okay to open up. It's okay to be vulnerable. Here, let me, let me, let me see your eyes if I can. In church, it's okay not to be Okay. Like it's okay to be in a place where you need to say, I'm struggling. <laughs> Please, someone notice. I'm insecure about this. That's why I front so much like I'm not because really deep down I, I'm insecure. It's okay that you're not perfect. But let me say something. It's not okay to pretend that you're good when you're not. As a church, we're family. We're the body of Christ. Love's supposed to cover sin. We're not supposed to hide from each other. See, we live in a world of Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and everyone has a filter and every image we share with those who know us and those that don't, it's like carefully curated and presented to give the best possible light on our life. And it's killing us. It's exhausting. One article I read this week said, since it's a relatively new technology, there's little research to establish the long-term consequences, good or bad, of social media use. However, multiple studies have found a strong link between heavy social media and an increased risk for depression, anxiety, loneliness, self-harm, and even suicidal thoughts. God is not the God of suicidal thoughts. God is not the God of self-harm. God is not the God of loneliness, anxiety, and depression. God is the God of hope. God is the God of encouragement. God is the God of peace. You want to experience that God? Let me share with you four ways. Here they are. I'm going to throw them up on the screen one more time. It's about a lifestyle of service, not selfishness. It's where you live your life in such a way, like Paul said, I'm a, I'm a slave to Jesus. He's my, he's my guy. He, he's my leader. He's my Lord. It's also about daring to dream and making a plan for the sake of the gospel. Now, there's dreamers out there. Don't get me wrong. There's people that make plans. But is it about the gospel? Or is it just about you and your tribe? Well, me and my kids, man, we're going to be... That only goes so far. That kicks rocks in the Grand Canyon and hoping to fill it. Center your life on the gospel and dream a little. How can my business, how can our family, how can where I live benefit the work of God? I'm not talking about like, okay, everyone now needs to just sell all their businesses, start wearing the same clothes like monks, and let's just all get the same haircut, and let's all start falling. No, it's like right where you are, not, not uniformity, but unity. Make your days doxological. How can you take what God's given you and dream a little? How can this be used for Jesus? Number three. Live to give. When you are resourced, resource others. This is a hard one. This is where a lot of Leos might be in the room, right? Like, oh, there's that handle. Backing away from that, right? I know it takes faith to trust God. I know it does. I know it's hard when you have resource to be able to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this. Where is it going to come again? I don't know, I'm not God. I know he's faithful. I also know we're supposed to be content with just some clothes and a roof. So maybe like a little bit of alignment with what we need and what we want could be helpful, maybe. But then lastly, 
transparency, authenticity, and I would add vulnerability are the greatest currency. I'm going to go ahead and invite the team up that leads us in worship as we just finish this. But these are handles for us to position our lives in such a way that we could really live for God and thereby living for God. Something. Ultimately, these things point to Jesus. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is the greatest servant who humbled himself to the point of a, a like a peasant. We sang about it. Remember, he, he was born in this like cave. I know Christmas time you saw the barn that looked like the, the stable. The stable in that day was a hole in the ground, like a cave. And a manger, doesn't that sound great? Jesus in a manger. That's the place where animals spit. That's where Jesus is hanging. He came as a servant, came from heaven to earth so that those of us on earth could go to heaven. That's who Jesus is. He's that servant. Jesus. Did he plan? Did you know that there's a plan of salvation that was in effect before the foundations of the world? Peter tells us that. He was simply following the plan that God had for him, his father. Did you know that Jesus, he gave his life for you? He lived to give. He was, he was the He's in heaven. Resource. You want to talk about resource. He let all that go so that you could become his kid. <sighs> vulnerable. Was Jesus vulnerable? I know we don't put this in Sunday school coloring pages, but did you know that Jesus, when he hung upon the cross, he hung there completely naked, scourged, bruised, battered, beaten. I don't know if you get more vulnerable than that. So that you and I could be forgiven and set free and have a family and have a future. That's who Jesus is. I don't know you and all your dynamics, but I can't say this about me. That's a guy that I'm going to follow. <laughs> That's a guy that I'm going to live my life for. The guy who doesn't tell me to do something that he hasn't already done. Yeah, I'll follow that leader like the leader who's willing to go ahead of me. Jesus has done that. He's the servant. Jesus is the one who dared to dream this great plan of salvation. Jesus is this one that gave his life. Jesus is this one that's vulnerable before us and has called us to be vulnerable before him and to come boldly before the throne of grace to ask for help in our time of need. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is our great king. He's our great savior. He's our dear friend. Because everything else is passing by, man. Every relationship, every resource, every experience. It's like a moving train. And some people are in your life for longer than others. Spouses and children and those beautiful things. But it's a gift. You got to hold on loosely, right? 38 special. We talked about that last week. Like, Hold on loosely to the things God gives you. That's how you best enjoy them. You cling to them. And they become idols. And when you set up idols in your life, God will seek to destroy those things that distract you from him. Live your days, make your days doxological about the glory of God. There's benefit to it. It's not, it's not why we're doing it, but you get to experience his peace and his patience and his hope. But as, as Paul said in Romans 12, where this whole thing kicked off, it was about how to live in the light of the gospel. Man, live your life as a living sacrifice. That's where joy is found.